Well, good day and welcome back to the Johnson Space Center for today's mission status briefing on flight day four of Discovery's final flight to the International Space Station. With us today to discuss all of the activities involving the 12 crew members on the shuttle station complex and upcoming activities is the STS-133 ULF-5 International Space Station Orbit One Flight Director, David Korth. David? All right, good day everyone. Um, what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the current system status for the orbiter and station and then talk about what we've done today on station, what's coming up this afternoon, and a preview of some things coming up in the next several days. Um, to start with, uh, orbiter systems are performing well. Uh, we had a couple of things that we looked at over the last few days, uh, but everything's cleared themselves up. Uh, in fact, the uh, debris avoidance team has received all the imagery. And I understand there was a question to Brian Lunny um, yesterday regarding how many uh, RPM photos did we take. And we uh, took 302 photos, uh, 100, 155 with the 800 millimeter lens, and the uh, balance 147 with the 400 millimeter lens. All of those are, uh, are being analyzed right now, but the uh, debris avoidance folks have uh, decided they don't need any more information uh, from us uh, to assess the orbiter, so no focused inspection will be required. Uh, so with that uh, pre-flight agreement, uh, we're going to uh, take flight day six, replace the focused inspection time uh, with the PMM ingress. So we get to uh, shake hands with Robonaut a little sooner than what was on the original timeline. So we're all excited about that. Uh, let's see, cryo margin wise, uh, we've got the, the spits up and running. It's doing well. Uh, we've got two days, three hours of, of margin with uh, spits, about 23 hours without. Uh, let's see, the, uh, we're working through some, uh, we were working through some issues with the uh, humidity separator uh, on the first day or so, had some condensation. We hooked up a uh, day early the uh, condensate to uh, CWC bags and everything's been working well, so we just got a, a jump start on condensate collection. Uh, so that's really it with the orbiter. Uh, I said everything's doing really well with the orbiter, the orbiter crew's doing well. Um, from a uh, station side, all systems are nominal, uh, with the exception of, of the Vosduke, which we had, had planned to uh, remove and replace uh, a little bit later in this mission. Uh, it, it was up, it was down, it was up again, it was down again, and, and right now uh, it's been up again. The, uh, the Russian crew members have uh, reactivated it. It's been running for a little over three hours now. So uh, they're trying to get it to uh, basically uh, get along for a couple more days before we replace it with a new model. This, this Vos Duke actually was the original one, so it's been up there for quite some time, and it's done its job well. Um, the crew last night, uh, I know you talked to Brian, and he was uh, previewing um, what was coming up today and what they were looking forward to last night with the ELC-4 installation. They, the crew uh, elected to stay up uh, about an hour and a half or so, or so late into their workday and finish up the ELC-4 install. Uh, it's, it's in its... Uh, permanent location on the S3, uh, starboard three, uh, lower work site. It's got power, it's in grid shape, uh, but we let the crew sleep in a little bit this morning, about 30 minutes or so, to make up for the time they spent last night getting that accomplished. Um, with re respect to what we're doing today on station, it's kind of a, a myriad of different activities. Uh, primary among those, robotics. Uh, we're uh, positioning the, uh, when I left console, uh, we had already handed off the OBSS to the shuttle arm. It had maneuvered to uh, the viewing position uh, for EVA-1 and for uh, anything else that we may need for PMM install viewing. Uh, the uh, station arm is in the process of walking off to its position on the MBS uh, to support EVA-1 So, uh, and for the translation again tonight uh, from, uh, for the MT from Worksite 3 to Worksite 2. Uh, so all is, is going well on, on timeline with the robotic ops. Uh, the Europeans um, finally had their chance to uh, get in there and fix their water on off, off valve number eight, WOOV eight. And uh, Paolo was uh, knee deep in, in WOOV when I left. He's, uh, he's a little bit ahead of the timeline, I would say. Uh, what we're doing is we're, uh, we're gonna bring this old WOOV home and we're installing a uh, kind of a, a bypass manifold to uh, take its place. Uh, we, the uh, shuttle brought up a new uh, WOOV that we're gonna use as a spare. Uh, there's been um, 
some uh, gel-like deposits that we've seen on the, uh, the valve stems of, of a number of these different woofs that uh, is just due to the, the liquids that are flowing through there and the, uh, the temperatures around the valves and it just forms these little gel-like deposits. Um, they've seen it on a number of them. This one seemed to have gotten stuck and it was uh, time to just clean it up and, uh, and bypass it. Uh, so the, uh, that's, that's going on schedule. And of course the other main thing we're doing today is getting ready for EVA number one tomorrow. Um, the, uh, the crew will begin. I'll give you a couple of, of times here so you can uh, keep up with the timeline. Uh, airlock camp out will begin at, uh, and I'll talk GMT, I'm a station guy, I'm a GMT guy, but um, GMT uh, 59 days, one hour, 48 minutes is when we'll uh, begin the uh, airlock camp out tonight. And that will be uh, Steve Bowen, Alvin Drew, hanging out in the airlock. Uh, MET, if you're following MET, three days, three hours, 55 minutes. Um, hygiene break begins bright and early tomorrow morning at uh, GMT 1203, which is a uh, MET of uh, 14 hours, 10 minutes. Um, we're poising for a six and a half hour EVA. Got a number of different tasks. A lot of them are uh, a compilation of different makeup and get ahead tasks. Um, we'll go out the door at a GMT of 1618 uh, or MET 1835, and we'll come back in around 2243 or MET zero hours, 50 minutes. Um, two, two tasks just to highlight. Um, one of them is the pump module, which we, uh, we all got to know and love a little bit closer a month or so ago. Uh, we'll be moving that out to the ESP2 site where the, uh, the new pump module came from. And uh, first thing on EVA2, on flight day seven, we'll be venting it. So we'll, uh, we'll put it in a good long-term long -term storage config. Hopefully try to bring that back on a future shuttle flight. Uh, the other uh, item of note for the uh, EVA tomorrow, uh, there's a, an expansion connector we're gonna make, uh, J612. Um, we're doing that before we uh, berth the PMM module on uh, flight day six, just because the uh, connector places on the outside of uh, node one, the airlock, uh, are hard to get to uh, once you put the PMM in place. So sequentially, it just makes sense to get this task done, and then we'll move on to uh, installing the PMM on flight day six. And let's see, I think, I think those are the main highlights that I had for the next couple of days. And as I mentioned, uh, because no focused inspection, on flight day six in the morning, we'll start off with PMM installation, and then the afternoon we'll uh, We'll get into PMM ingress and, uh, like I said, shake hands with, with uh, Robinon. So uh, with that, I'll open it up uh, for any questions anybody has. Okay, we'll take questions here. We also have reporters on the phone bridge, and we'll start over here with Denise. Hi, Denise Chow, Space.com. I was just wondering if you could go over um, Tim Coper's involvement in tomorrow's spacewalk, what he's going to be doing here for mission control. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're glad that, uh, that Tim's up and moving around. In fact, he's in mission control right now. Um, what he's going to do, because he trained uh, to be one of the EVA crew members, he's going to be here as, as one of our um, ground uh, EVA co uh, Capcoms. So he's going to be following along, helping the guys, uh, Steve and them, um, work through the EVA tasks from a ground standpoint. And I think that's going to be a tremendous asset and, and help to all of us. Other question, Robert? Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, regarding the uh, J612 cable, um, there's been times in the past on EVAs that, that astronauts have had trouble hooking up cables. So can you just uh, describe a little bit about what type of connection this is? And also, if, you, if they can't get it connected for some reason, does that hold up um, or actually cancel uh, berthing the PMM? Um, as to the type of connector, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that. I don't, I don't have that in front of me. Um, as far as what do we do if we can't mate the J612 connector, uh, as far as the, the mission priorities are concerned, berthing the PMM is, is a top priority. Uh, in fact, of the, the four prior, main mission priorities we have, docking shuttle, getting ELC-4 out on the uh, S3, the next one is PMM berthing, and then undocking the shuttle. And the original plan that we had way back when was uh, didn't include any EVAs at all. So we were just taking the opportunity to, to uh, get this thing taken care of when we added some EVAs to this mission uh, because it's hard to get to. 
if for some reason we have issues, I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion, but based on priorities, uh, we go ahead and put PMM up there, uh, get it installed on Node 1 Nader, just because that's one of our top objectives for this mission. And, and just to follow up, um, is the um, JAXA's message in the bottle EV, uh, EVA activity still planned for this EVA? Yeah, it will be, uh, its timeline is the last activity before the crew comes in the, uh, the airlock. Over here. Anna Chikane with Harvard Journalism. Since all the vehicles from the international partners are sent, um, David, can you give us your idea about what it means for the international cooperation that's going on in this mission? Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting that uh, everything kind of came together the way, that, you know, unfortunately the shuttle flight slipped, but it slipped um, enough to where we have ATV from the Europeans, we have HTV from the Japanese, of course Progress and Soyuz from the Russian team, and now shuttle from the U.S. team, and it it sort of uh, solidifies the international effort that we've uh, all experienced over the last 10 plus years now on station. So it's kind of exciting to have all these people involved at the same time. It's a lot more work because there's a lot more people involved, but it, it really uh, highlights the international presence in space, I think. Okay, with that, we'll take uh, questions from reporters on the phone bridge. I believe Marsha Dunn is up first. Yes, hi, um, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press. Will there be any um, changes to tomorrow's spacewalk as a result of um, Steve Bone's late addition to the mission? I'm just wondering if anything's being altered or left off. No, there are no changes to the uh, timeline for tomorrow. And uh, two more questions. Um, he, he's only been able to train for a month. Uh, granted, he's an experienced spacewalker, but I'm just wondering if you anticipate him to be able to carry out everything um, as well as Tim Cooper might have been able to do if he had been on board. Yeah, as you mentioned, um, Steve Steve brings a wealth of EVA experience. He's already had five EVAs, a very seasoned shuttle astronaut, um, and he took he picked right up uh, quickly in, in the uh, NBL runs, coming up to speed on uh, the tasks that we have. Uh, of course, you know, everybody's unique. Uh, Tim, Tim's a unique guy, and, and of course we all miss him on board on the ground. Uh, he's part of the EVA team here, still with us on the ground, as I mentioned. And uh, Steve, Steve will do just fine, and we have absolutely every confidence that we'll knock off all these tasks. And we have a, a nice list of get-ahead tasks for EVA-1 as well, and, and we're fairly confident we'll get through those as well. Thank you. And my last question, um, as late as launch day, the Robonaut people have told me that they're not going to be able to unpack Robonaut for at least a couple more months. And you mentioned shaking hands, and I didn't know if there's been a change of plans, or will Robonaut remain boxed up until after the, long after the shuttle leaves? Yeah, I, the, the shaking hands is more of a, a figurative. Um, as far as getting into Robonaut, yeah, the, the stage plans, it takes a lot of time. There's a lot of packing with Robonaut. It's got a lot of sensitive equipment on it. Um, so the stage plans don't call for it to be unpacked uh, for a little while. I don't have the exact date, uh, but given the fact that we're going to get into uh, the uh, PMM on flight day six, uh, we're going to start making headway at unpacking, and uh, you know we'll see how far we get. Okay, Mark Carrow's up next. Uh, yes, Mark Carrow from uh, for Aviation Week and Space Technology. And uh, my question is, uh, looks ahead to the spacewalk, and I think I just wanted to make sure I knew where uh, ESP2, the final resting place for the uh, pump module is. Is that is it on the Quest airlock? And once the module or once the, the pump module is on ESP2, uh, as the spacewalk progresses tomorrow, does it need power and cooling and that sort of thing, and will it receive it there? Um, yeah, as far as the uh, the pump module will go on ESP2. Uh, that will be its its resting place until we uh, can find a way to, to bring it home to refurbish it. Um, I'll have to get back to you on all the, the specifics of what resources it needs uh, on ESP2, uh, and uh, I'll check on on the exact location of ESP2 now. I don't have that in front of me. Okay, I think Irene Klotz is up next. Um, thanks very much. I had a couple questions. Um, the first is, do you know when um, 
the uh, um, hardware that Dexter has been, I guess, hanging on to for about three, three and a half weeks now is going to be moved on to the um, ELC4. Yeah, we've, as, as you know, we, uh, when uh, the uh, HTV came up, we pulled a couple of items off of there, some spares, uh, a CTC that's got uh, some extra batteries, and a uh, FHRC, and uh, we put them on Dexter. Um, we'll be moving those over to the, uh, the ELC uh, later. I don't have an exact date for when we're going to put those on there. Do you know it's gonna, if it's going to be during Discovery's uh, stay there? No. Not not planned at this point. Hey, um, thanks. The other question I had is, uh, do you know what's next for Dexter um, operations? Did you say what is next for Dexter operations? Yes. Um, I know we're going to reposition Dexter uh, for EVA2. Uh, beyond that, uh, it's really there uh, as, as a holding point, a temporary holding point for the, uh, the CTC and the FHRC. Uh, beyond that, we don't have any specific plans for Dexter in the, in the near term. Okay. All right, I believe uh, last up on the phone bridge is Todd Halverson. Todd, are you still there? Okay, I guess not. And uh, ESP2 does reside on the Quest airlock, actually, for Mark, if he's still listening out there. Okay, any questions back here before we close? Don't see any, so we'll close with some programming notes. At 1.43 p.m. Central Time this afternoon, uh, a variety of crew members will be involved in the first of our in-flight uh, media interview opportunities that will be with the Weather Channel. WBZ Radio in Boston, WSB Television in Atlanta, and WTVT Television in Tampa, Florida. The mission management team briefing this afternoon with Leroy Kane, who's the chair of the MMT and the deputy shuttle program manager, will be broadcast here on NASA Television at 3 p.m. Central Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time today. The crew is scheduled to begin its sleep period at 9.23 p.m. Central Time, right before the first airing of our daily flight day highlights. At 10 p.m. Central Time, those will be replayed every hour on the hour throughout the crew's sleep period. And at 3 a.m. Monday morning, the Orbit 3 ISS flight director, Chris Edelin, will be interviewed on console with an update on any replanning efforts and a preview of uh, the spacewalk that's on tap for Monday morning. The crew gets awakened at 5.23 a.m. Central Time Monday morning to complete preparations for that first spacewalk of the mission. You can follow all of the events of Discovery's flight to the International Space Station on our website at www.nasa.gov. So stick around. Uh, the MMT briefing at 3 p.m. Central Time this afternoon, spacewalk number one on Monday. Until then, we'll go back to mission coverage. Thanks very much.